In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers, a priest is able to have compassion on the ignorant and erring because he himself is also beset with weakness. And by reason thereof, he is obliged to offer for sins sacrifices as on behalf of the people, so also for himself. These words are found in the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. The Catholic religion is a religion, as someone has observed, of paradoxes, apparent but not true contradictions. Begins in many ways with those shepherds who had to listen to angels in order to find a lamb and wise men who had to follow a star in order to find wisdom. And there was a new mother who remained forever a virgin. And the hands that made the sun and the stars too small to reach the heads of the cattle above the manger. It goes on when the king of the universe is crowned with thorns, and a divine carpenter is nailed to the wood of the cross, and when the author of life is put to death. And when what is thought to be the end is only and now a great beginning. And this extends, of course, to what happened after the resurrection when this divine carpenter who hung on the cross and like a new Eve from his pierced side came forth, his body and his spouse called the Catholic Church. This too was wrapped in paradox. This church which he made to be and which he keeps holy and sinless is composed entirely, almost entirely, of sinners. A true paradox. And a paradox that is, comes to pass when we also experience his mercy, his love, his pardon, and his forgiveness. The institution of reconciliation, the sacrament of confession, of penance, happened in that same room where shortly before there was the wonderful and splendid institution of the Holy Eucharist and the priesthood. In that cenacle, he came through those closed doors and breathed on his disciples the Holy Spirit and those marvelous words, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. It's the marvelous and splendid and admirable thing to remember that in that act, he put into practice what he proclaimed so loudly in the course of his preaching in his earthly life. The Son of Man has come not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And so we who are called to the priesthood or already priests, have the great privilege of taking all that forgiveness won on the cross, poured into our hearts and into our souls, and distributing this to God's people. But to do this effectively, we ourselves have to be recipients of the great sacrament of reconciliation and penance. We, as much as any and even more than most, must hear the words, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. We must try to make ourselves uh, the subjects uh, of the sacrament so that we can, the objects of the sacrament, so that we can become the subjects of that sacrament. We have, of course, in recent centuries, the greatest and most wonderful example of how to do this in St. John Marie Vianney. When his bishop sent him to ours, he said, I am sending you to a place where there's very little love of God, but you must put the love of God there. And he went, as we know, strolled through the fields to his new assignment, and uh, a bit lost in the crossroads, asked the little boy called over from the children playing, show me the way to ours, little boy, and I will show you the way to heaven. This is the destiny of those who are going to be priests to show the world the way to heaven. And a good portion of that road travels 
through what is called the confessional, throughout our travels through the pardon, the forgiveness, the loving eyes, the mercy of God himself incarnate in the divine word. When he came to ours, John Vianney had 270 parishioners. At the end of his life, he had heard more than 80,000 confessions. Special trains were coming down from Paris, packed with people going to ours to go to confession. What a marvelous and splendid thing. Few events in history, in the history of the church, can equal it. Maybe the shadow of Peter there in the Acts of the Apostles falling on the sick that they put in the doorways of the houses. Or maybe, uh, just maybe, the throngs saying Hosanna to the son of David as they uh, greeted the Lord on that first Passion Sunday. As the donkey that carried Jesus in the words of Chesterton said, I too had my hour one far fair hour and sweet. There were shouts around my ears that day and palms before my feet. We ourselves must be people of confession. We must make use of the sacrament for our own spiritual benefit and then bestow it with generosity, with all the hard work and penance that might be involved on God's people. And we must use the sacrament as a vehicle, not simply for the remission of serious sin, but as a very important step on the ladder to heaven for our own salvation. In Mediator Day, Pope Pius XII said in memorable words, to hasten daily progress along the path of virtue, we wish the pious practice of frequent confession to be earnestly advocated. Not without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was this practice introduced into the church by it, genuine self-knowledge is increased. Christian humility grows. Bad habits are corrected. Spiritual neglect and tepidity are countered. The conscience is purified. The will strengthened. A salutary self-control is attained. And grace is increased in virtue of the sacrament itself. After the Second World War, a group of American GIs in Italy made a pilgrimage to San Stefano Rotundo to visit Padre Pio, who of course is now St. Pio a Petralcina. And uh, they had, because uh, the crowds were nothing like they were in recent years, the opportunity to talk to the saintly stigmatist. And one of them asked, what is the greatest sin in the world? Second World War had just finished with horrors beyond calculation not just the Nazi Holocaust, but equally and surpassing that Holocaust, the horrors of communism. And the slaughters throughout the world of 20 or to 25, 35 million people in this uh, ab uh, abominable conflict. And they thought maybe too the sins of the flesh that were so pervasive in the nihilism that followed the Second World War would be what he talked about. But instead, he said, the greatest sin in the world today is the denial of sin. And this, he was reflecting something that Pius XII himself had said. And this goes on even in our time, that sin is not called sin, not a malicious violation of God's will, not a volition and arrogant affront to the Almighty Creator, but rather describing sin as a sickness, uh, the victim uh, uh, who is claimed to be a sinner is actually afflicted by uh, hormonal adjustments, uh, that somehow or another uh, all sin is excusable and explainable. Uh, it goes on, and of course it permeates our culture. There is in Arizona a place where they raise coral snakes, one of the most deadly snakes found in North America. They raise them because they want to get out of the venom, the material to make anti-venom for any people who may have been bitten by some of these kinds of snakes. And they were all shocked one day when one of the snake handlers came down himself with a snake bite. And he said, how could you do this? And he said, I was careless. I was surrounded by these snakes all the time. It was my daily work. 
And I didn't realize, I didn't reflect on, I didn't remember how dangerous uh, these snakes are. We turn on our television set, we look at our newspapers, we're surrounded by sin. And we can forget that this, what seems so commonplace, is really a horror. That there is in mortal sin a malice beyond our ability to calculate this creature that would dare to defy its creator, this piece of pottery that would try to talk back to the potter. And it's important then that we ourselves recognize in our lives those things that are disjunctive from God's will so that we, in our labors and our example, but as well as our preaching, might be able to tell our people what this is. And in telling them that, not to condemn, but to remind them that pardon and forgiveness, the loving view of a loving God, is available. As many have said, St. John Chrysostom most notably, God gives to priests what he does not even give to angels and archangels, the ability to lift a hand and to say a few words and to remove from the soul of a penitent the horrors, the leprosy of sin. Cardinal Newman said it seems that angels alone should be appointed to this high office. And yet, God sends forth for the ministry of reconciliation not angels, but men. He sent not beings of some unknown nature and some strange blood, but, dear people, your own bone and your own flesh. He appointed these sons of Adam, of Adam men like unto us, exposed to the same temptations, exposed to the same sins. And so we come to a reconciliation service reminding ourselves that this is a time to encounter the loving view of Jesus, the loving mercy of our divine Savior, who calls us to share in his great and ongoing and eternal act of pardon, forgiveness, and love. Priests are called to do this because they are able to have compassion on the ignorant and erring, because they themselves are beset with weakness, by reason thereof are obliged to offer sacrifice for sins as on behalf of the people, so also for themselves. Amen. <laughs>